Hello and welcome to episode two of the Slow Crafting Project. If this is your first time tuning in, thank you for joining me and uh, if you're a returning viewer, big thumbs up. Um, hello, my name is Nadine and I live in the northwest of England and uh, I'm going to talk to you today about what I've been doing over the last two weeks, incorporating um, slow crafting into my everyday sort of making and doing. Right, okay, so over the course of the episode we will look at finished objects, works in progress, uh, upcoming plans for the rest of the sort of the next two weeks and um, looking a little bit more as to how slow living fits into what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, not just uh, in terms of crafting and then my thoughts on podcasting so far. Yes, okay, so first finished object. I'm wearing it. Oh, I'm hoping YouTube doesn't pick that as my thumbnail again. Very unflattering. Keep my hands down. Um, yes, it's a pussy hat. Um, many of you may well have taken, play, uh, taken part in either the Was Women's March in Washington uh, or any of the 616 other sister marches on Saturday. Um, I wasn't able to attend a match myself, but I wanted to show support um, for all the women out there who were, and for women's rights in general, uh, or human rights in general. Um, so, I, uh, beginning of last week, I decided I would cast on a pussy hat and uh, wear it with pride. Um, it's made out of hand spun yarn, the sort of first yarn I spun on my wheel when I got it two and a half years ago. Surprisingly consistent actually, I was expecting it to be a lot more lumpy and bumpy than it was. Um, it's a uh, double knitting weight um, and I knitted it, I don't know if you can see, uh, the ribbon uh, was on, oh it's a lumpy bit there, uh, four millimetre needles, um, so I did cast on 96 stitches on four millimetre needles, did two by two ribbon for about two inches. Uh, and then just knitting stockinette until it fitted my head in it and then kitchenered the top closed. Um, I do have to keep messing with the ears to make it stand upright but uh, yes I was really pleased with it. Um, I had a few people ask me about it when I was knitting late because I was uh, knitting at the local toddler group so I got to talk about uh, the women's marches and, and uh, things like that and the Pussy Hat project. To, to people that asked me about it there and uh, when I've worn it up to uh, nursery to pick up my, my oldest daughter uh, I got to speak to women there about it as well so I, I think I played my own little part on raising awareness of the Pussy Heart Project and, and women's rights so right that's the first finished object over and done with second finished object is spinning um, here is hold it still focus it quite well actually um, my latest spin, it's the fondant fibre um, sister's braid, it's uh, grey merino and silk blend, I'm not sure as to percentages, it's uh, 258 metres in 100 gram skein, it's a, a two ply, I um, spin everything, uh, short forward draw. <laughs> I have a style, it suits me, it gives me an like. So, um, oh, there we go. It's a bit lumpy and bumpy, uh, but I think that's partly to do with the, um, yeah, I'm squishing, uh, to do with the silk uh, content. It's, um, I've not managed to develop a technique that drafts silk smoothly. So, uh, I've, I've got the odd slub where the, the silk was, just, was quite, sort of quite prominent in the blend. Um, it is lovely and soft uh, and no it doesn't smell all fondant fibre uh, stuff tends to smell really nicely with the braids when you get it get it through but it's been in my stash for two years so um, some of that's faded. But yes I, I look forward to, to knitting with that once I decide um, what on earth I'm going to knit so for now it's just going to sit and, and look pretty in my stash for a while. Well actually for now once I finish this podcast, it's going to go straight in the box, ready for packing up to move house on Friday. <sighs> Luckily, I'm finding time to squeeze this in. I was um, not quite sure whether 
I, I managed to find time or not, but uh, all being well, assuming I don't mess up and have to record it again, I should be able to have time to, to do it this morning. Okay, moving on to works in project, works in progress. Um, first one is knitting, and this is my uh, Saturn cardigan, cardigan by Hilary Smith Callis. Uh, here's the, the original pattern from uh, Knit Scene 20 Summer 2013. Um, it's a fingering weight cardigan, um, but I've, I've chosen to, to modify it slightly. Um, last week I was just past the armhole separation, um, but uh, so far I've got ooh, down to the ribbon. don't know if you can see, it's, it's particularly bad on the back. It's already curling up. There's only five rows of ribbing on the bottom of this. Now. I think I'm going to have to block this every single time I wash it to stop it from rolling up. I could go back, because it's knit top down, so I could go back and uh, rip out the cast off and knit more ribbon, but uh, I, want, I want to do other things. So <laughs> we'll see how it wears. We'll see if, if I need to go back and, and fix it, then I will. Um, so, I, I, like I say, I finished the body. Um, I've almost finished the first sleeve. Um, I did have to modify it slightly because I've got quite fat arms. So um, I picked up a couple of extra stitches underneath the, the armhole, and I've got sort of down to the elbow. And surprisingly, it, it, it fits nicely enough down to there. But I was supposed to carry on the decreases, sort of for another ten centimeters or something. Um, but it's not going to happen. So uh, for the last, so the last ten centimeters of the, of the sleeve, I'll just work straight stocking it. Um, so yes. Uh, so once I've done that, I've just got the second sleeve to finish, and then the button bands to do at the front. Um, if I look a bit all over the place this morning, it's because I've finally managed out managed to figure out how to um, flip my camera around so that. Uh, you can actually read the um, titles of books and things that I show you. Uh, but it means that I'm moving in the opposite direction to, to what I think I am, so it's all a bit confusing for my poor brain first thing on a Monday morning. Okay, next work in progress um, is the swing skirt from the Alabama Channing Sewing Patterns book. Um, I showed you this last week. Here's the well, one version of the skirt in all its glory. Uh, I'm making this for my mum. Um, now, one thing I, I, I want to say about this, um, I've made uh, the corset from the, this book for myself, and um, fitted fine, but you have to be prepared to be a size uh, larger than you would possibly be comfortable with. Um, I know that the, the sizes in here go up to a XXL, uh, they're listed as rather than numbers, but I think that equates theoretically to a, a UK size 16. So if you want to be, if, if you're a bit sensitive, then uh, having to describe yourself as a, a double XL when you're only size 16, probably is it, it, not going to give you a help you with, with your sensitivities um, but if you just ignore it and think I'm just making the size that fits we'll get that. we'll get on with that um, <clears throat> now I did have to uh, redraft the pattern slightly because although I think the the waist measurements are, are fine for for a size 16 not that my mum will be happy with me saying what size I'm making, but um, I don't think the hip measurements necessarily uh, equate well with the, the waist measurements. It, it, it might be industry standard for, for measurements, but um, if you've got an hourglass figure um, and your waist is considerably smaller than your hips, like myself and other members of my family, then um, they don't 
you are going to have to do some pattern drafting and, and alterations. Um, right, so the skirt itself. I've got the, the pattern cut out. It's a um, PDF pattern. Um, you get a, a CD included with the book which has got all the patterns on PDF uh, or on the CD and you have to print them off and, in PDF format and uh, stick them all together. Not my favourite pastime, but uh, I did it and it's uh, worked quite well. Um, and I've got all the pieces cut out. Um, I'm making the double layered skirt so uh, I've got two different fabrics involved. I'll show you just one panel. This is the top layer. My mum chose these fabrics herself. Um, this is um, from, it, it, they're both jerseys. This, this is a, it's a synthetic jersey. Um, I, I forget the fibre content, but it, it's, it's definitely got man-made fibres in it. It's from Abacan. Uh, I uh, bought it online um, and when it comes to making my clothes I am trying to be a bit more focused on natural fibres and smaller scale producers more so with the wool fibres with fabric I think small steps I'm only just get, getting back into sewing clothes again so I'll start with A what I can afford B what I can access readily and C take my slow fashion approach to be creating my own clothes rather than looking for ethically produced and sourced um, fibres and fabrics. At this stage I, I may go on to, to look at, at, at something more uh, towards that side of thinking but, but for now I'm, I'm just taking fabric that I, I can find to, to, to make my own clothes. Okay, right. Um, here we go. This is like I said, from, from Abacan, uh, it's Jersey. It was quite expensive, uh, it was about £12 a metre, which I know when we're looking at quality fabrics is, is um, n not that much because it was certainly less than the 100% the cotton Jersey that's on the other side. Um, but it, it's more than I'm used to paying so uh, I was quite glad I didn't need a, a, a massive amount for the skirt even though it's for my mum and I shouldn't grumble at, at buying or spending money on her but uh, yes, take some, some getting used to. Uh, this, on the other side, one side out, I've tacked them together for now, tacked the panels together. This is um, sort of a, a smoky blue 100% uh, cotton jersey and that is from the Village Haberdashery, also online. Um, that that was more expensive than the other one, I think that was because it, it's sold by the quarter meter so uh, you have to do your maths to work out how much it is per meter so I think that worked out at around about 15 pounds per meter um, then there may be cheaper sources of 100% um, cotton jersey out there but for me as I was also buying the fold over elastic for the waistband and the uh, top sewing thread um, for which pretty much used for sewing up the entire garment, um, not just for top stitching. As I was also buying that from there because that had a good range of colours in both the fold over elastic and the top sewing thread. Um, it, it made sense to buy the, the fabric from there as well. Sorry, I'm putting my hands on the table and shaking the camera. Um, so yes, I'm hoping to, to uh, get that stitched together. Um, over the next two weeks. I'm, I'm still not sure about the reverse applique and what pattern I'm going to use for that so I might lose a few hours on Pinterest looking for, for inspiration because um, I'm not sure any of the templates given in the Alabama Channing book would necessarily work with the, the pattern on the, the fabric. Um, I think a lot of her patterns in the book she uses plain colours uh, or sort of single colours in the fabrics and my mum wanted something jazzy, um, so she got something jazzy. Uh, so yes, I, I, I shall probably have a look and see what I can find um, to, to inspire me as to the top stitching. I'm, I'm, at the moment, I'm thinking it might work up a little bit small. So, partly because I'm not used to working with a, a six millimetre seam allowance, which is, seems tiny and I automatically 
end up stitching about a centimetre um, but also because the, the panel width seemed quite narrow um, and I've measured them up against my hips and it, it, I'm uh, slightly smaller hip width than my mum and I'm not how sure how she's going to feel about the general fit when, when it's finished so I'm hoping she likes it after I've spent all this time making it but we, we will see, time will tell. Right, moving on. Um, so that's all my whips at the moment. Uh, upcoming plans. Uh, now, I'm not wearing any, well, other than the hat, I'm not wearing any uh, hand knits today, but the jumper that I do have on, it's a commercial jumper. It's a polo neck three quarter sleeve, um, sort of loose fitting. I don't know if you can see. Loose fitting. Uh, jumper comes to it down to about my hip level. Now, the reason I decided to put that on today is um, because, uh, yes, <laughs> brain function. Um, yes, it's one of the items in my wardrobe that I wear a lot. It, it's not homemade, but um, it it's something that suits my lifestyle and, and, and the things that I do on a day-to-day -day basis I can just put it on and get on and, and not worry about it and it looks okay it I wouldn't necessarily say that it flatters my figure and makes me look amazing but it works that does me um, it's, it's actually from a very dreadful shop well not dreadful but a shop synonymous with fast fashion that begins with P and uh, I've had it about eight or maybe nine years now so in terms of fast fast fashion it's had a much longer life than uh, a lot of things generally do um, but anyway getting back to why I was uh, why I'm wearing it I decided that I wanted to make something out of hand spun that had a, sem a similar style and fit to, to the outfit that I've got on now so I had a search through my hand spun stash and pulled out um, some yarns that I thought would, would work. Um, a selection of greens actually. I'll just bundle them all together. Oh, ooh, there we go. The sort of greeny browns and greeny blues and greeny yellows. Uh, one of them, this one, is, I don't know if you can see, is beaded. Um, I had a go at turning out a beaded yarn without really thinking what would what I'd do with it uh, once I'd finished. They're all uh, fingering weight approximately. Um, most of them are two ply except for this which is single. Um, the, m these three are merino commercial top. Um, this one uh, was several colours um, sort of blended together. It's got a lot of energy in this yarn, as you can see. This is one of my quite early spun, so it is very much over overspun and over plied, but I'm hoping that'll help it wear well. Um, and this was just a, a commercially blended one already um, that I, I just spun straight as a, a two ply. Um, these are uh, merino, bamboo, and soy. Um, blend that I picked up at Woolfest life before children um, probably about four years ago uh, maybe even five thinking about it um, so yes that's that's what's on the card cards for what's going on my needles after I finish the cardigan um, as I was packing up to, to move house um, as I mentioned I came across the, what I think is possibly the world's oldest working project, work in progress, um, and it's this dress. Uh, now, don't know how well you can see this. Uh, it's that's that up. so essentially, it's a dress that I started ten years ago. Ten whole years, um, but never finished. Uh, the pattern that I used is 
version D. Oh, there we go. Yeah, version D of the new look. What number is it? 6615. Now I've done it in a cotton because at that point I didn't necessarily read the instructions as to what fabrics would work best with it. Um, so I should have used a, something with a bit of stretch to it because it has no fastenings, no zips, no buttons. So it's just pull on, pull off. Uh, because I've used a cotton, pull on, jiggle it, jiggle it some more, <laughs> pull off, jiggle it a lot. Um, but yes, I, I when I first got this pattern, I cut out uh, the fabric for four dresses out of this. Uh, one in black with small flowers printed on it, which um, I wear all the time and, and have done since I made it. Um, and then I did I had one that was white with pink flowers and one that was lilac with white flowers. Now, I never wore those. I finished them, but I, I, never, I never really wore them until earlier this summer or last summer when I decided to dye them, uh, over dye them with a, a green and a brown, just sort of a Dylan dye pack, sort of cold water dye pack. Um, and now they've, they've gone into rotation in, in my wardrobe and, and work and look look quite nice. Um, this dress, this blue one, um, the fabric is some cotton I got from John Lewis. I used to spend my life in John Lewis before I moved. Well, where I, when I was living, where I was living when I when I made this dress, all my money went on fabric or yeah, fabric or knitting books from John Lewis and, and expensive perfume. It doesn't now, certainly not now. But uh, yes, it, it, it's uh, it's lovely. I love the fabric, um, but the the dress itself, getting back to it, it needs sleeves. I think I did actually cut those out so they'll be somewhere in my craft stash but that's all boxed up and in storage at the moment. Um, so it needs sleeves and it needs hemming and it needs the, some of the tacking stitches taken out. I think instead of finishing it as a dress I'm actually going to crop some of the bottom um, and make it into a tunic so sort of, sort of halfway down my bum maybe just past my bum length and maybe sort of split the side seam slightly um, because it is quite tight around my hips with it having no stretch. Sorry, I'm shaking it again. Um, and then possibly do some bias binding around the sleeve so I can have a, a sleeveless dress to wear it as almost like a pinafore over t-shirts, long sleeve t-shirts and things. So yes, that's that's what's coming up on, on the sewing front. But uh, I don't know whether to uh, do any embroidery on it because I've I think it needs something else and, and part of me is wanting to put some brown embroidery on it because I love brown, <laughs> brown and blue, I think they'll look lovely together but uh, excuse me I've got a bit of a, a, a lurg at the moment so uh, I need the tea to stop me sounding all croaky and I've spoken for considerably longer than I did last time. Right. Uh, so we've done upcoming plans um oh one of the other sort of things that i plan to do over the next two weeks is because i want to uh incorporate slow living into my my crafting and and uh, my making and doing i thought it might actually be, be beneficial to look into a bit more of the background as to slow living how it came about how it applies to uh, sort of everyday life and, and and things like that so i ordered myself a book. Um, Carl Honore, or Honore, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, um, is uh, sort of one of the leading proponents of the slow living movement and this is, is his book. It's published in 2004 I think, um, In Praise of Slow, so it's quite old but I thought I'd start towards the, the beginning. Certainly of the modern slow living movement I know sort of that there's been sort of previous incarnations and uh, what have you but um, I thought I'd start with, with this book and go from there. I do listen to the Slow Living podcast a lot and I love that and that, that gives me sort of a more up-to-date interpretation of slow living and, and how that how people are incorporating that into their lives. Um, but the <laughs> one thing I did laugh at in this book because I, I had a quick flick through there is a chapter entitled the unhurried child. 
So incorporating slow living into parenting. My children are not unhurried. They'd love to be, um, but no, certainly if you'd seen us this morning getting ready for the, the nursery run, there was a lot of hurry. So uh, there's probably quite a lot of lessons that I can uh, take from that chapter, but it, it, it did make me chuckle. Um, right, uh, in terms of how slow living currently fits into my life, um, we have an allotment, so we try and grow uh, a fair bit of our own food. food. We're not self-sufficient by any means, um, and uh, this year might be a challenge with uh, moving house and, and everything else, and finding time to be ded as dedicated to allotment in as, as we like, but if nothing else, we will fill the plot with potatoes and have enough potatoes to live on. Um, or potatoes, onions and onions. We won't, we won't get garlic this year because we didn't put it in in time. Um, with not being sure when we were moving. Uh, we've got fruit trees, so oh, fingers crossed we uh, will get some apples, possibly plums and possibly damsons off there. We do have a pear tree, but it never produces anything. Um, there are other pear trees on the allotment, so it's not because it's a, a lone pear tree. But uh, yes, yeah, so in terms of, of slow living, growing our own food, taking time to, to do gardening, um, that, that's one way that we incorporate it. Uh, another way is that I don't drive, um, so I walk pretty much most of the places I go. Uh, if I need to, if it's too far to walk, I will either get get some form of public transport, generally bus or a tram. But if I can walk it, I will because I would prefer, you know, if, if anything up to about five miles. It's easier to walk than to try and take a pushchair on and off and a toddler on and off a bus and a tram. and anything else anything a bit further than that and then um, yes I'll go on public transport we do own a car so if we're going somewhere as a family we, we do tend to to drive but again if it's a longer distance if we can walk we will walk as a family um, we, d we didn't actually own a car until our second daughter was born um, so two and a bit years ago uh, so if we were traveling long distances we'd, we'd hire a car for the weekend but everywhere else we went on foot or, or by bus. Um, so that's another way that we incorporate slow living into our lives. And um, cooking, yes, uh, I, I love to cook. My other half loves to cook. And we cook most of our meals from scratch. Possibly, oh, I'm trying to think, more so, but also less so now that we have the children. Uh, my youngest daughter has a lot of food allergies, so we do a lot of uh, cooking from scratch just so that we can make sure that it is wheat free, gluten free, dairy free, egg free, pretty much everything free. Um, but they are also, especially the youngest one, is quite fussy with what she can eat. Um, not just as to what she's allergic to, but what, what she will willingly put in her body. So there's no point in giving her quinoa because it's just not happening. <laughs> we, we do tend to have, eat quite simple foods um, and uh, rather than sort of elaborate um, elaborate meals um, but don't get me wrong that there are occasions when I will spend a good couple of hours in the kitchen making something for tea uh, but then there are the other days where it will be cooked from scratch but it will only take me something that takes me half an hour okay um, right my thoughts on podcasting it's interesting. Um, I'm a little bit creeped out when I, I watch myself back, um, just to sort of make sure everything's as it should be. I'm not sure I'll watch this one back though, because it's it's up to nearly half an hour now, and uh, that's a lot longer than I was planning. Um, yes, I showed my daughter. Well, she she should see him somehow on YouTube because we we watch podcasts, knitting podcasts, and sewing podcasts together. Um, but she somehow clocked that there was I'd appeared on screen and there was a video of me to watch. So she asked to watch it. This is my, my oldest daughter of three. And she sat all the way through it and at the end of it she looked very serious and said, Mummy, are you proud of yourself for doing that? <laughs> now, I don't know whether she was judging me for, um, I couldn't, t couldn't tell at the time whether she was like, Mother, you've put yourself on the internet. Are you proud of yourself? <laughs> 
Um, I'm like, well, I've done it. So yes, I am a little bit proud, but I can still see room for improvement. Just like, oh, good. I've always wanted you to do a podcast. So I thought, oh, I, I was quite pleased because yeah, she is very uh, judgmental and tells you exactly what she thinks. So if she thought it was rubbish, she'd have told me. My brother, on the other hand, I, despite instructions not to watch the podcast, did, and then proceeded to take the Mickey out of me on Snapchat. Not kind and not funny. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm hoping this is too long and he won't watch this. Um, so uh, yes, and yeah, one other thing I learned about podcasting: don't read your YouTube statistics. You can get sucked in. It's it's. I love that there's a small number of you out there that have watched it, but it doesn't do me any good to click on it and find out how many of you switched off after two minutes and how many of you sat through to look right till the end. I should just go, okay, I've put it out there. If people watch it, people watch it. If they don't, they don't. Silly be. Right, um, I think that's got to be pretty much it for, for today. Uh, thank you for joining me and a massive thank you if you've made it through till the end. Um, I think this is a bit longer than I, I'd want them to be, so I'll try not to waffle so much on the next one. Um, fingers crossed it will be in two weeks' time as normal. Um, well, they can't really say normal when it's only the third one, but yeah, plans are for it to be in two weeks' time. But this depends on um, how it goes with the move. Um, if there are any last minute glitches, we might not get moved on Friday or. We might not get the internet reconnected as quick as it is as we would have wanted. Um, plans are that it should only we should only be without the internet for a couple of days, but that was the plan last time we moved, and I think we were out without it for about two weeks. So um, hopefully, it, it will all go to plan. Right, uh, I definitely need to get off now because I can see my neighbour coming down the street, and I don't want her to be able to see through the window and see me waffling at a computer screen. <laughs> Alright then, thank you for watching and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye!